Hey guys, I just wanted to bring your attention. We are going to be running a free masterclass on February 23rd at 6 p.m. UK time. That's 1 p.m. Eastern time. If you're looking for more qualified leads, if you want more visibility, if you want to increase your income, I'm going to be sharing a masterclass where you can create and build your own digital summit. Now, I had zero experience when I launched this a couple of years ago, but we managed to master this. Three summits later, we've managed to make over six figures. We've managed to create 5,000 qualified leads, and we've managed to get on the front cover of some of the most reputable magazines in the world. So if you're interested in learning more, click on the link below and join our free masterclass on February 23rd. It's a free masterclass, it's an absolute no-brainer. You have nothing to lose, and hopefully you'll get some great information. See you there, take care. This is the Game Changers Experience. Deep dive conversations with leading business disruptors, Olympic athletes, celebrities, entrepreneurs, and influencers from around the world. This show will teach you insights about the winning principles in mindset, productivity, marketing, branding, entrepreneurship, business strategy, and more. Hosted by Productivity Authority, business strategist, former elite athlete, author, and public speaker, Adam Strong. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Game Changers Experience with myself, Adam Strong. And it's great to be here. I love doing these live shows. And for you guys that are listening to the recording, well, listen, we do do these live shows. You can also, if you want to um, really sort of tune in and, uh, and and ask questions and get involved with the Game Changers experience, then you can do so by following me either on LinkedIn or also subscribing to my YouTube channel. And just make sure you click on that little bell to notify when we come into the room. So listen, today's show is by no means different. It's going to be um, fun, packed, engaging. For you guys that are listening in uh, through our podcast or whatever it is, and um, you know, you're going to have an abundance of different notes. So make sure you've got your notebook and pen handy because we're going to be uh, taking you on a bit of a ride today. So listen, without further ado, I want to introduce our guest of today. He turned into a really good friend of mine. Um, we, ha- we share some very good common values. Uh, his name is called Nick Bradley. Now, Nick is a, a basically a world-renowned business growth strategist, expert, if you want to call it. He works with mainly business leaners, uh, entrepreneurs, and investors. And what he does, is he helps to build high-value companies, Right. So he's worked with joint ventures, joint venture capitalists, and, and and really kind of over the last decade has really helped. He sold actually 24 different businesses over the last decade and raised over $5.2 billion, which is really impressive, a great track record. He's also a podcast host. He's a, a podcast host of uh, Scale Up with Nick Bradley. It's the UK's number one business podcast. We, I guess we must be number two. <laughs> He's, uh, we're going to be talking about how to create a life-changing uh, exit, whatever that means to you guys. So some of the things we're going to be talking about, we're going to be talking about, for example, what our investors and VCs and uh, are looking for in terms of uh, investing into businesses. Uh, when they consider um, acquisition or merging with other businesses. What do you need to put in place if you are a business owner or you're looking to acquire a company? What are the things that you need to look for? What are the things, uh, what are the red flags that you need to look for in particular? Um, and you don't need to have any ex- any experience, by the way, with this, okay? Experience helps, but, you know, making sure that doing due diligence and research is really, really important. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about what investors are looking for as well. Um, and uh, really tapping into to Nick's knowledge. So, um, so without further ado, my good friend, Mr. Nick Bradley. Hey, Adam, how are you, man? Good to see I'm you. I'm very good. Good to see you as well, buddy. Uh, I I'm, can see I'm fresh off uh, the plane. I'm fresh off the plane from Dubai. I literally. I was going to li- say, I- like, you look <laughs> like you've just come off the beach. I'm like, what? You, you, you're like glowing. Do you know what I mean? You're thank, glowing. Thank you, mate. It's, it's all the moisturizer they give you um, in business class. <laughs> I feel, I feel like I've got to, I feel like I've got to use like this Bulgari kind of set of stuff and just put it all on. So I literally, I, I thought, you know, I'm going to see Adam later. I'm going to see all of his, his community. I've got to make my face look at least nice. Absolutely. hundred percent. I love it. Love it. Love it. Well, it's interesting. Uh, you know, uh, how was your trip to Dubai, by the way? Was it good? It's good. Yeah, it was fantastic. I caught up with some friends there. I also caught up with um, uh, Lauren Tickner, who's a friend of mine out there. And she actually was quite funny. We caught up uh, around the marina in Dubai uh, and went for a walk because she had to get her steps in. 
Got it. <laughs> <laughs> love it. But love uh, I think she didn't she speak at she spoke at your Game Changers Summit, didn't she? Um, recently as well. Well, she actually um, there was a, a bit of a communication breakdown, unfortunately. But oh, really? I'm sure that we're going to be um, collaborating a little bit further on down the line. So that's not a problem. But yeah, we love cool. Lauren and we love um, what she stands for. She's great, and, and I love some of her Instagram reels as well. So kudos to you, Lauren, if you're listening to us. Excellent. Well, it's good All to be good. here, mate. So as I said, I'm uh, got a bit of sleep. Got a bit of sleep on the plane. So that's here, good. To, here, that's to, good. Here, to, here to here to serve as best I can. Absolutely. So if you guys are listening to the recording, if you have any questions, uh, we, you know, we try to make these as fun as and interactive as we can. Uh, but if you're listening to the recording of this and you have any questions, feel, feel free to connect to Nick on any of the links uh, on the link below. Um, and uh, we'll make sure that we put those there. But I want to really kind of jump into this because this is uh, an area which has really piqued my interest, especially as um, I've got a few sort of buddies, including yourself, that are in the kind of M&A space. And it's really a buzzy word right now. Yeah. Um, but let's talk a little bit about um, just really, really briefly, because um, I know that some people, some of our audience, uh, and they're all over the world, they not, you know, they don't really know of your area of expertise. But how did you get into the area of, of um, you know, selling and buying businesses, first of all? Yeah, so it started quite a while ago. I started close to now. 15, 20 years ago, I, I started working in the world of, of corporate for some big media companies. And I was in effectively what was the strategic marketing team initially. Uh, but that was thinking about customer segments, markets, growth, obviously. And the transition for that, if you like, or the step up from that was into corporate strategy. And that's where sort of mergers and acquisitions or what I like to call the faster growth opportunities sit. So I was involved in, yeah, I was involved in both. It was great. So organic growth, which is, you know, growing one customer at a time yep. and then acquisitions, mergers. And eventually I ended up in the world of private equity, spent about a decade there. And that's where I did 117 acquisitions and it's 26 exits now that I've been involved in because the last few years I've actually been helping entrepreneurs sell their businesses. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's been a ride. <laughs> it's always a ride, but I quite like it because it's, you know, we can get into it today. It's not as complex as some people think. And mm. what I like to say is that any any small business owner, when they get to a certain threshold, should be looking at these things. If they're not, they're missing the opportunity to grow fast. You know what? I, I, it's interesting. I think it's especially over the last sort of six months or so, it never really, I suppose, occurred to me about the importance of M and A. And you know, and, and and like I said to you, it's it's been a real buzzword, especially over the last. I don't know, 18 months, 12 to 18 months, more yep. importantly, you know, it's, it's a bit like when, you know, when property and real estate became like the real kind of, oh, you need to get into property and real estate like many, many years ago. But now, you know, the, the coin has flipped because people are now seeing that there's uh, different options rather than just kind of, you know, if we want to create wealth or passive income or whatever it is that you want to call it, right? Um, you get into property, but actually it's not the case now. Um, yeah, you just got, it's always, it's one of those things that's funny though, Adam, I think like in the same way property has always been there, this mm. has always been there, but right. but there is a dynamic. I think where it started, and I'm again, this is where I found it quite interesting. I've been doing it for a long, long time, but I never saw it explode like it has in the last three years. When there was a Forbes article written in 2019, 2020, just talked about this transition of wealth. Yeah. And what it said is uh, effectively all these baby boomers are retiring and mm -hmm. a lot of them have assets, obviously, that they've accumulated over their, their working lives. And many of them are business owners. And the figures mm -hmm. were crazy. It was like 10,000 baby boomers per day. And this is still true today, by the way, are retiring in North America. Right. And this is the other one that really kicks it. There's something like 1,600 small businesses per day, again, in North America being closed down. And these are wow. not startups that are failing. These are profitable businesses like mum and pup shops, that sort of thing, right. getting closed down because there's no succession plan. And wow. you think, so this is, you know, to, to finish the point, and this is the thing I really believe in, entrepreneurship is not a, a linear play. Like you, entrepreneurship is not just starting a business. If you can go and buy a business and enter the world of entrepreneurship from that, that route, that vehicle, then that's just as valid as a startup. True, true. And we'll touch base on that, actually, a little bit further into the conversation, because I'd be interested to know more about that. But sure. I want to talk a little bit about um, I want to talk a little bit about what makes a company or a business valuable to be considered either for acquisition or, you know, to create some sort of merger with another company when it comes to, 
you know, um, needing extra finance or whatever it is, but what makes a company valuable? Yeah, there's usually, I say there's four things to look at. And, and when you think about why do companies buy co companies, usually it's because there's a, a viewpoint that the two together is mm. going to drive faster um, growth, what I call exponential growth, yep. or it's going to create more value. It's like that old saying of one plus one doesn't equal two, one plus one equals three. I've seen it one plus one equals 11 in this type of scenario. <laughs> and that's partly because private equity, private equity exists to grow value in a very, very precise way. Right. So if, if private equity is effectively these, these big firms that raise funds from pension funds, from high net worth individuals, they accumulate that, that together and then they'll go buy a business, right? Got it. They'll buy a business, but then when they buy that business, they don't expect that business just to grow slowly over time. Mm. They expect to bolt businesses on. It's called buy and build. And when they bolt those businesses together, the value just goes through the roof really quickly. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's kind of the thing. But to get to your question, so why does, why does this happen? Well, first and foremost, when you put financials together, and I'll just talk about this quickly, like if you bring revenue together with more revenue, profit together with more profit, there's, there's accumulation of value. So something that's got more profit is worth more than something that hasn't. But not mm -hmm. just in terms of, well, of course, that sounds obvious, Nick. You know, of course, there's more money. But the the the, the way that a business is acquired, it's the multiple usually of the profit, which dictates the price. So if a business yep. is making, let's say, a million dollars profit, yep. Yep. that might be worth four to five times that if someone was going to buy it. But if that business was making five million in profit, it might be worth 10, 12 times. Wow, big jump. Yeah, massive. And the jumps, you know, again, it's arbitrary, but that's kind of how it works. So financials is one reason. Second reason is there's a product that that company has yes. that my company is thinking about building. But you know what? Instead of wasting all the time resources to do that, why don't I just buy that company and then I've got the product? Okay, so right. that's kind of a speed to market piece. Then you've got um, customers. So let's say I want to move into the US and I want to sell my products and services in the US instead of launching a sales team, setting up an office, why don't I buy someone who's got a beachhead there and I can then, you know, explode from that, that place, a little bit like a Trojan horse. Analogy. <laughs> and then the last reason, which I think is one of the really interesting ones is, is the quality of the capability, the leadership and people. Mm -hmm. So instead of me hiring you, Adam, cause you're awesome yeah. at this stuff, right? You're great at networking, building on events. You know, why don't I just buy your business? And then I've got you, right? I've got the capability that you've got, but I've also got your customers and revenue and all that as well. So there's right. some of the reasons why people would do it. Got it, got it, got it. I mean, there, there's some great examples. I mean, um, I mean, Amazon do it a lot, don't they? And yep. Apple do it a lot. Heaps. You know, they just swallow people up. <laughs> <laughs> there's, more, there's more acquisitions from Apple than you expect. I looked at it the other day. It's like, it's almost a hundred and something in the last few years, but they're small. They, they buy little tiny things like little bits yeah. of technology and whatever else. But yeah, it's, it, it, all the big companies are using acquisition as a major tool of growth for sure. And they've done it for years, but you just don't really hear much about it. Well, I, yeah, unless you're looking in the right places, of course, you know, you don't really hear so much. I bet, I bet since we met though, and, and and you said other people that, you know, I bet you're more aware of it now because oh, as soon as you 100%. see it, it's like, it's like, it was almost like once you see it, you can't unsee it. That's, <laughs> That's why it's That's quite true. funny. And like, it's like, oh God, yeah, well that, that business in my, you know, I, I spoke to the guy at my local golf course or my cafe, like that happened to me. <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, why not? Right. You know, why not? Interesting. Love it. Very cool. Now, in I want to go back to your point actually earlier on, which was all about um, the baby boomers in particular and stuff. But there are lots of what I call tired business owners. Right. And, yeah. you know, the people that have been in business for you know a long time, you know, lots of experience. They're kind of stuck in their ways. They may be a plateaued in the business or whatever it is, but effectively they want to exit the business. Right. Um, uh, but the reality is, is that so many people, because like you had mentioned there, they don't have an exit plan. What is the, and, and, and it's real sad to see that people just walk away without a penny in their pocket. They just close down the business Yeah. and, you know, and, and, and like the customers lost, the data's lost, everything's kind of lost and whatever it is, but why is the numbers so big? You know, why is it that? you know, a lot of these people that you come across on a regular basis are making the same common mistakes. Is it down to education? Is it because 
they're kind of like self-sabotaging. I'd love to know what your thoughts are about, number one, the reasons why the figures are so high. Number two, why we're not seeing more people actually exiting for a penny or a dime in your pocket when they do retire. Yeah, there's a great question. And and, and the, the, the underlying reason is people just don't think about it. Um, mm. or they think about it too late. So I was having a conversation literally just before this with someone saying you've got to have an end game, right? It's the most yeah. important thing. And that end game might be 20 years down the track. But, you know, to your point, the people that I come across, the people who are at retirement age, so they're in the sort of 60s and 70s, sometimes even a bit older, uh, something's usually happened. Mm. And it's something that happens to everyone as we get older. They get, they may be sick or their partner's sick or just something's happened, a, a massive life change. Yep. And we call that a distressed or a motivated seller. Now, what's interesting about that, it's not a distressed business, right? So the business can be great, but something happens. And first thing is people aren't prepared. The second thing is there's a knowledge gap of how. So quite often, if we think something's too difficult, we put it in a, in a, in a bucket over here or True. a box and say, <laughs> well, you know, whatever. You know, it's like that whole thing. If I, if I eat really badly every single day, but I don't think I'm going to get sick because I can't see it right now. I don't worry about it, right? It's that sort of thing. Right. Yeah. So you've got that going on. And and the reason it's happening at scale now, it's a simple market economics thing. It's a buy, buying and um, selling or sort of, you know, buy demand supply play where you've just got a transition of the baby boomers going through. So for people who don't mm -hmm. know that, it's worth it's worth a Google. But obviously it was all the children that were born after the Second World War coming through. Um, and there was just so, so many people born for reasons you can probably guess, you know, and, um, and just as they're reaching that retirement age, you've just got so many businesses out there. And that's why as a buyer, someone like myself or someone like you know yourself, Adam, or someone listening to this, mm. there's just, a, there's like just too many things out there. So yeah. it's, I, I don't want to say that it's like super easy. You've got to get out there and be focused and find the right business for you. But mm. I often send people to a website called biz buy sell. Remember I mentioned it to you. Absolutely. And that's a, a US website, but it's just for fun. And you can go onto that website. It's a whole heap of businesses for sale in uh, North America. And you can look in every state, every every sector, and you can actually look at businesses and you can see the reasons in the in the kind of information as to why people are, are trying to sell them. And it's mm. all retirement, 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 retirement. <laughs> and, and then the second thing, it's crazy. And the second thing is they, there's a thing there called seller financing, which we can get into, which means that not only is the business for sale, the seller, the person retiring, is happy for you to pay for the business on what is called deferred payments. So you don't have to pay all the money up front. You can agree right. that I'm going to pay for the business over three years, four years from, and this is the cool bit, from the profits of the business you're buying off them. Right. Exactly. And 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 that's a fa I, I don't know about you, but it, for me, it's kind of like I see it as a bit of a um, a common myth. You know where where you, and that might be the reason why there's not enough businesses being bought in the M and A space because there's this common myth where oh you know you know this company's valued at a million quid or whatever it might be you know and people think that they need to have a million quid outlay you know that realistically that's never going to happen I mean that's right do you know what I mean so not many you people know, you know not many people in in the world have that capacity of having the cash just sitting there right yeah. and that's why people think it's the big guys that can only do m a right but the, what, I, what i'd say is this right when you buy i'll start small right when you buy a car most people yep. most people lease a car or they do it on some sort of pcp finance deal right that's right now yep. you, you and i might have the money in the bank to go and spend 20 30 40 50 grand on a car but we choose not to we choose to pay it over time and keep cash yep. reserves whatever right Yep. If you then escalate that up to a house, most people don't even have the money to buy a house outright. Let's say your house is 300000 for whatever it is, right? And so what do they have to do? They have to go and get a mortgage. But then to your, again, like what you said, like, but in businesses, people then think, well, why would, why would it be any different that if I want to buy a business worth a million, okay, a bit more money, we get that, that yep. I would suddenly have to turn up with all this cash yep. when you can do exactly what you do with a mortgage, you leverage against the assets of the business, yeah. borrow against those, and that gives you a, a certain percentage of the money to be able to get the deal done. It's interesting. I, I, and I do think, it, I, and I think you've highlighted about the fact that it is a common myth. I think there is a, a, often a misconception between, you know, the, the whole kind of mortgage example and buying a business. I mean, 
it just doesn't make any sense to me but hey ho um <laughs> it's the same thing but you know what i i'm really transparent around it like there are there are people out there who say you can get these businesses for no money down right zero right. money down yeah. um and it, i've done a couple like that so it's i'm not saying it's not true but you've got to have right. a very interesting situation for that to happen so like it's you've got to be finding quite a lot of distress in my my view uh or you've just got to have superhuman levels of rapport and all these things but you can go and buy a business for like 10 percent, 15 percent of your own cash or an investor's money down got it so to your example a business that's worth a million dollars you might have to find a hundred thousand dollars from somewhere but you're getting you know 900k back that you're leveraging true you know it's interesting because i don't know about you but i've come across conversations especially over the over the years that i've been in business when i've been speaking with uh companies and business leaders and it amazes me especially what i would call the more inexperienced sort of entrepreneurs and then it's like you know what's the purpose in in the whole kind of you know building a business starting a business you know what is your exit plan and 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 they haven't a clue nick i don't know about you but they they haven't a clue they're like but i don't want to exit my business you know I, you know if it gets bigger then i'll just be in the background you know it's I, do you find those conversations are quite common there's th- there's three exits adam right so one exit is the one that i try and um inspire people to look at which is where you sell your business you exit the business you sell it for a, a multiple which is effectively going to get you rich right you know certainly financially free uh, yeah. a lot of my clients will sell their businesses and they'll take home an eight-figure sum okay yeah. so that's anything over the, in the tens of millions right so that's more money than most people ever need right certainly if they invest for it the second exit is where you keep the business let's say it's a smaller business but it makes a lot of money and you hire a manager uh, and then you decide you want to go and do other stuff and the business runs and i've got a few businesses like that where you know, I make, I make money off them. I don't do anything in them at all. I'm not even involved. Uh, they're not massive businesses, but they, they generate reasonably good income uh, and we don't think about them. So what I call semi-passive to some extent. Semi-passive, okay. Yep. And then the third exit is you die, right? So, <laughs> so, so, so what I say to people is without being morbid, you're going to get an exit. Like there's a point where you're not going to have the business forever. Uh, so try and take some control of the terms of that exit when you can. That to try not kill yourself is what Nick's saying, guys. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't be the guy. And the other thing you mentioned beforehand, like it's not just about selling your business and getting some money in your pocket. If you have to close your business down, you've got costs, right? Exactly. You know, sometimes you've got to pay redundancies. If you've got some staff, you've got to try and sell stock. If you can't sell it, then you've got to, you know, get rid of it. I mean, so, so you actually can lose money if you don't have an exit plan as opposed to even making something. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? I never actually saw it from that perspective, but you're absolutely right. Very mm. cool. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, personal branding just really, really briefly. Because, yeah, sure. you know, I mean, as a you being in this game for, for, for quite a number of years, I mean, how important is it to build this personal brand so that an investor, a VC, um, or anyone that is looking to do a business deal with you, partner, do strategic alliances or whatever it is, how important is it is to build a personal brand, number one? And, and you know, do they really look for those types of things when they, you know, type your name into Google and think, oh, you know, who is this guy type of thing? You know, especially if it's a cold call and you don't maybe or maybe you have a very, you know, a very what we call infant infancy type of relationship or whatever it is what's your thoughts about kind of personal branding because i think it's a little bit overlooked and a bit kind of i don't know not just overlooked but i think that i feel like people are a little bit ignorant about it i don't know about you there's pros and cons so i've I've been in this game for a few years now and um the reason i did it is i i have a belief that it's easier to attract the right people towards you if you stand for and against things so, so this when I, when I say it's it's good and bad, what I mean is there's also a risk to that, because there'll be certain things that I say that are absolutely going to alienate me from other people, right? Yeah. And yeah. and sometimes, and I'll be really really um, transparent about it. Sometimes that's not always great because you know the the argument is oh well they're not your people they're not the people but but sometimes they are but it's just there's a values that misalign right. But I found the reason I do it, the reason I do the podcast and all that sort of stuff is. It allows me to, it allows me to put my message out there, genuinely with what I'm trying to do, which is to help people, you know, create freedom from from these these businesses and scale up and exit. 
And if they need to hear that, they I'd, I'd prefer to be able to put the message out there and then they can come. And, you know, if they like what I'm talking about, they can find out more about me, right? And they can listen to me on the podcast. Some people listen to all the bloody episodes back to back. Right? <laughs> and they, but I do, I get messages. I'm sure you do, Adam, where people say, you've changed my life, man. Like, you know, and, and I, I sort of, I still pinch myself a bit from that. Yeah. So, so I sort of think to people, if, if, if you, if you really want to have a go at something and you want to leverage the opportunity that's been presented through metaverse, you know, social media, whatever we want to call it these days. Yeah. You've never had a better opportunity to get your, get your voice out there. And if you think about, well, what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is, you know, you have to go out there and find people and then you have to try and convince them that you can help them. Mm. And it's just a long process, right? Mm. It's much easier to have that magnet of people coming towards you. So I say to people, you know, it's changed my life, right? It really has from where I was doing the private equity stuff. I wasn't known to anybody before. And these mm -hmm. days I've got friendships, partnerships, you know, we met through this. I've got going to Florida next week. I'm catching up with my mate, Matt Andrews. He's bringing right. his kids and his, and you know, his whole family to Disney with, you know, my wife and that. And these are people that I met on places like clubhouse podcasting. I, I interviewed Robin Sharma yesterday, one of my yep. heroes, you know, yep. um, Great and guy. He's, yeah, he was cool, but just opportunities like that have come from creating a personal brand. So that's my view is I think it's a really important thing, but I'll finish by saying, I, I totally appreciate it's also not for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. That that makes complete sense. <clears throat> you know, and, but I, I suppose you kind of have to weigh up the pros and cons, you know, and, and, and this whole kind of, I don't know, it's not that it's an imposter syndrome problem, but it's kind of like, you know, it, pe some people that are listening in, they might, they might not want to be seen out there. Do you know what I mean? It's or it's kind of like, it might be a confidence issue. I don't know. It could be. I think it is. I think it's um well putting yourself out there takes courage, right? Because yeah. if you think about it, um, most of us, I'll say you and I, but a lot of people like to hide in the shadows. And yeah. <laughs> and you know, and 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 this is the thing, like as I said, I said, yeah, I get people come and say that the stuff I've done has changed their life. Equally, I'll get people saying, you know, they wish I was dead, right? Mm. <laughs> and and that's the <laughs> dream. <laughs> well, it's true. I had I did have, I had a person person write to me and said, I hope you die from drinking the devil's urine what that's a bit extreme i don't know what it was from <laughs> but then but then you've got to take i didn't do anything wrong right like you know in my mind anyway but you've got to contextualize it to say everyone's everyone's living their own world right and they've got their own yeah. perceptions values and what you say that will absolutely help one person is possibly going to be the opposite of what another person thinks and so i can see people get worried about that and what i find is it's a little bit like going to the gym and working the muscle Mm. fitter you get the more you work the muscle the more you kind of get used to it it becomes a habit and routine so i just don't care about it anymore yeah very true uh, what about investors and and sort of venture capitalists and you know uh, sort of investors that are looking at you whether 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 it be in the big wide world of the internet or whatever it might be but do investors and venture capitalists and capital equity firms do they look for you being out in the big wide world do they do their due diligence and check you out and, you know, like to kind yeah, of a little bit, but they, they're not the people I'm trying to work with. So, right. so they, they tend to tolerate me. <laughs> so, <laughs> Just <laughs> and the, re the reason for that is, and, and, and listen, it's, it's all, it's all very fair and amicable, but it's what I've done is I've taken what I call the playbook of private equity. That's kind of a little bit like a secret handshake club. Yes. And I've demystified it and made it more simple and approachable, yes. even though it's still got its own complexities. And then what I've said is if you're a business owner, let's say you're a business owner that's just hit seven figures, right? You've mm -hmm. built a good business. You're, you know, it, just getting over the millions. Um, and you're in that sort of, how do I get to eight figures? Right. I'm, I'm teaching those people how to do that, the private equity way, the quickest way. Right. And, and the, the most valuable. Way. And that kind of can great sometimes with, with, with investors who are like, well, why are you doing that? Because that's how we do it. <laughs> <laughs> is it do you think it's like also I, I i get a feeling of this kind of culture of insecurity on their part i don't know what's your thoughts on that well you've got to think that what i'm what i'm really doing is flying below the radar of what they're trying to do to sell up the chain to them so yeah. what i mean by that without being too cryptic is you know there are people, um, usually young MBA types, sitting in private equity firms, and all they're doing every single day is writing or calling up small businesses 
um, and playing the massive rapport play. Got it. And quite often, and a lot of my clients are like, I get these letters all the time. I said, yeah, I know. You will. <laughs> and, and what I found is sometimes it works out really well for the business, right? Um, but quite often the, the business owners don't know what to do and they go down a process and they don't quite get what they should have got, right? And so, so I sort of go, well, instead of doing that, why not get ahead of it and start to act like they're going to act? So, so instead of waiting, you know, reactively to be acquired, if that's if you decide that's your exit, why yeah. not get it get in front? Why don't you go out there and find your acquirer? Yeah. Why don't you go out there and do partnerships and joint ventures? Why don't you build? And so the stuff I focus on these days in the kind of scale fast, exit rich sort of playbook, what I call scale to sale is building back from that idea and making sure that the foundations of the business growth processes, all of it are aligned so that I know when a private equity firm comes or a corporate and they look at the business, they're going to be looking at it in a, in a way that I would have looked at it when I was in private equity and they'll go, yeah. this is really good. And I go, yeah, yeah. it is really good. And guess what? <laughs> now more expensive. And of course the entrepreneur, the business owners, they're going, what just happened? Well, not, not right. I'm, I'm being a little bit sort of, you know, gracious yeah, yeah. with it, but, but, they, but they're starting to see something very different. And if they continued on the path by themselves, they wouldn't have understood what they needed to do to get there. Yeah. So I just teach Perfect. them just a knowledge gap. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Let's get back to um, our conversations around um, buying businesses and kind of looking at the different options. Cause I know we, we talked about it on the summit, but I know that not everyone that's listening in um, was listening in and stuff like that, but let's talk about the different ways and how to buy a business. I know that there are ways to buy a business, yep. but there are also ways in which you effectively can exit your business and they're two different methodologies, but let's talk about buying a business first of all. What are the different options in which we can fund it? And you mentioned yeah. on our last conversation, you have you don't even have to have any experience or very little experience. Yes, you'd have to do your due diligence and so forth, but love to know what the ways are to buy a business first of all. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Well, you have you have to learn a process, right? So so <laughs> You know, there are businesses out there and some people intuitively because they've you know run their business as well for years kind of get it. I was with a guy last night in Dubai, a friend of mine, and he's in the process of exiting his business. And he kind of just said exactly what should happen. But it was it was very good. Actually, I was like, well, you, you know it. Um, but, you know, first and foremost, you need to learn some basic things. Right. So what's important in buying businesses? Well, you need to know, firstly, what type of business you're going to buy. Right. It sounds mm -hmm. simple. But, you know, where is it going to be? Is it going to be close to your home? Is it going to be overseas? Uh, is it an industry that you know? Is it an industry that you have a passion for? Uh, yeah. Those sort of things. What size? You know, what sort of structure? Um, so that's the first thing. That's, so we call that deal specification. Deal specification, right. Then you want to then work out a model or a process again of finding those deals. Yeah. And the simplest way to say it on this, um, on this conversation today, Adam, it's like a sales funnel. Yep. And I say you might start with, you know, in the in the sector that you said you were going to go after in the region, all those things, you might go out there and and try and find a hundred leads at the top of the funnel. So a hundred yeah. businesses before you even speak to the seller and work out whether it's for sale and all that sort of stuff, you've got, you know, that. And the way you can do that, you can prospect on LinkedIn, you can run Facebook ads uh, to a lead magnet, like, you know, all the basic sort of things. I find writing personal letters to people's um, home addresses on company's house is a great way of doing it. And That's you, can a good get, idea. you can get days to do that. So you can pay five to ten dollars an hour. So you don't have to do that, right? Yeah, yeah. But you get a hundred right out there, then you might get that down to 20 or 30 where you start to have some conversations. Yeah. And then from that, you might only get one or two deals away. So, but again, that psychology uh, method, if you like, of a funnel is how I think about it. So then you've got, okay, what happens then? Once you've got those 20 or 30, um, you know, you've got to call them up and you want to, you want to build what I call the, the first most important skill of deal making is rapport. Yes. Superhuman levels of rapport. And <clears throat> what, what that means um, is that if someone starts to really trust you, they're firstly going to hand over their baby to you, right? <laughs> so like, you know, if someone's been in business for 30 years, that's their life. That's the tricky so, part. Sometimes the, money, sometimes the money is less important. Sometimes it's like, you know, I've had Betty running the reception area for years. I don't want Betty to lose her job. Right. Could you know, these are the sort of questions you get into. So you have to show that you are that safe pair of hands. Yep. Secondly, if you're going to negotiate what I'll get into in a minute, that seller financing where you're going to pay for the business over years from the profits, no one's going to do that sort of deal with you unless they like you, right, mm -hmm. and trust you. So rapport is the number one skill. So you do all that. 
and then you get into um, negotiation and all that sort of stuff. But as you do that, this is where you would build a deal team. Yeah. And you need to have a really good M and A um, lawyer. You need to have a good um, corporate sort of finance person. There's quite a lot of people out there in this space who are trying to do deals. But the way I think about it is, someone leads the whole negotiation. Someone leads the deal. You know, yes. that's usually like a front person, whatever else. They're the one building rapport, etc. Then you have the finance and the legal teams. And if you buy a business that's not in the industry that you know, so I've done a lot of stuff in education, professional services, media. Let's say I want to buy something in manufacturing. I might bring in someone who's an expert in manufacturing and I'll split the equity with them. Fair because enough. if I want to go and raise some finance to get the deal done, and I'll explain that in a second, it's good to have someone in the deal team who comes from the industry, just provides more credibility. Yeah, okay? that makes complete sense. And then I'll finish by just saying the financing. How do you do that? So, well, there's different ways, but I focus on what is called leverage buyouts. And that's where you're leveraging the assets, usually on the balance sheet of a business to be able to borrow against. Things like um, real estate sits there, obviously, uh, machinery, um, any inventory. Uh, but the one I like is always things like receivables, where someone is effectively, the job's been done, the invoice is put out, you just haven't been paid yet. And remember, that's not the business owner's money, that's the business's money. So you can actually raise up to 70% finance against receivables. Okay. Nice. And so you do all that, right? That's asset finance. And then you agree, you negotiate with the seller. Okay, we're going to pay over three years because you want to go, you want to go sit on a beach or hang out with your grandkids. I'm going to take <laughs> the business off your hands, right? In order to do that, I'm going to pay you this amount of money up front, okay? The closing payment, and that comes from the asset finance. And then I'm going to pay you the rest over this period of time. And sometimes I like to get, keep a little bit of their equity in the business and say, why don't you keep 10, 20% in? And I'm going to, my job is here to scale it. I want to scale it and sell it, right? So the next three years. So if you leave a bit of equity in, that 20% is going to be worth a lot more in a few years' time as well. And a lot of them oh. like that. They go, oh, that's interesting, right? You know, But everything comes down to the credibility of whether you can do that, right? You know, you know, are you the person who can actually run that business and bring fresh thinking and new ideas to that business that perhaps you know they have have not got or they've just lost the impetus for? So... Um why did so quick quick question around that because you said oh you know you, you in, in a lot of cases you like to keep the business owner involved you know and give them sort of 10 20 percent or keep 10 and 20 percent already staying in the business why do you do that just out of curiosity well it means um the amount of money i have to raise up front is less as well oh, that's true. so <laughs> so remember i'm only buying 80 percent of the business i'm not buying i i will always take the majority I'll always, and I'll, I will always own the business. So it's not like yep. it's you're, you're running the business or not. Um, it, it's just, I find it doesn't happen in all situations, but if someone just doesn't want to run the business anymore, mm -hmm. they're tired, they're worn out. I mean, a lot of the businesses I look at, you go to their website, Adam, and, and it's like shocking. I mean, it's like... <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like something out of, remember MySpace? <laughs> you know, that, that, that social network. It's like, oh, a, it's like, what? It's like comparing <laughs> MySpace to Facebook or something, right? You know, and, <laughs> yeah. and there's typos and all this. And one of the things that's really important is two, two really good skills. Uh, if you're either an entrepreneur who wants to scale via acquisitions, or let's say you're in this whole great resignation thing right now, you're a corporate person who's been magical at oh, sales yeah. and marketing. <laughs> and you want to now be an entrepreneur. Well, my advice is go and buy a business. Don't start one, right? Go and buy something. But if you're good at marketing and, and you go into a business, they've got a bad website. They've never done any ads. They've just handed flyers out around the local thing. Just imagine how easy it is to optimize the marketing and then start to drive growth, particularly if everything else is in place. Yeah. So that's when how you, I sort of look at it. Interestingly enough, when you, because I know that you've obviously bought businesses yourself and you are yep. a business owner of seven other businesses and stuff like that. And I mean, I, one thing, one question that come to my mind and probably some of our audience's minds is how do you manage all of this, Nick? I mean, I know that a lot of the time you're not involved in the actual operational side of stuff, but then the question then that comes to my mind is, okay, well, if you're spending very little time in the business, then how can you increase the valuation of that company to then effectively either exit or hold it or whatever it might be? What's your, I'd, I'd love to know what your thoughts about that. And kind of what do you do if it was, you know, in your businesses and stuff like that? You know, how often do you go into the business? What yep. do you bring to the table? Um, you know, are there certain things that you. Yeah, let's start with that, first of all. So there's there's a couple of things here. The businesses that I'm buying are usually under sort of 10 million dollars. Got right? it. And the reason for that is 
I want to buy them when they're they're quite simple. I don't like complex things. I'm not buying, you know, SaaS Uber businesses and all that. <laughs> right. I'm buying I'm buying I'm buying car washes and you know laundromats and uh we're looking at kind of window fitting, you know, that sort yep. of stuff. Um heating, ventilation, you know, cooling, that type of stuff, HVAC businesses. Cool. Yeah. Um, services and or sort of product businesses that a product is being sold from that. But we really like the recurring revenue from the services. So nice. so to your question they're not they're not strategic juggernauts right so so the person that i want to run the business is probably more an ops manager than what you'd call an md even though you might call them an md got it and then the second thing is you know i'm not paying them to be strategic i'm paying them to deliver precision yep right high levels of precision yep and then what we do and i and i, I recommend this to all my clients as well we put a structure around the um management of the business and any of the kind of activities of the business and we work to what i call a 90-day cadence so we'll, we'll we'll have an annual planning process no more than that uh, we have a vision around three years for an exit but the the annual planning is the financials that's normally a day or a two day once a year event okay strategic what are we trying to do this year how are we can do it and I'll, i might bring some people in for that not just myself but Anyone I bring in is there to help with the strategy and the operational people are there too. The ops manager is there, but the ops manager is there is just to listen and understand what they're going to be doing. Yep. Then we'll have usually a half day or a day, a quarter where we focus on the strategic priorities and make any changes to those. And that's what I call the 90 day cadence or the 90 day sprint. Whatever's agreed on that day or that half day is then executed over 90 days. Yeah. And then we have once a month check-ins and that's normally a 90 minute meeting, 90 minute call zoom. Yep. And then if it's a new business or there's an issue, like, and sometimes that obviously happens, we'll have weekly calls for around about 30 minutes. Got it. But those weekly calls are everything. The other thing I'll say is everything is metrics driven, everything. Right. Thanks. So we're looking at scorecards and cadence and the, the, um, the playbook I used to use in private equity. And I still use to this day is by Gino Wickman, a book called traction. Nice. And we love the simplicity of that model. And we use that model quite a lot in the businesses, the businesses I've got. So it's a long answer, but effectively, <laughs> I'm not in the business operationally. I'm in the business strategically. I'm engaging with the business sometimes on a weekly basis still, but quite often it's a monthly basis. I'm looking at numbers all the time. I'm getting yeah. reports. Yeah. And then strategically, it's every quarter and every year that I am quite actively involved. But I enjoy that part of that. That's cool. And then you mentioned, um, well, I mean, what is your average uh, exit from a business? Is it, you said three years, right? We like to do three, but it can be three to five would be the average. It could be three to five. And, 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 and with the business that you've acquired, so for example, your businesses that you've acquired, yep. do the people that have, you know, uh, you know, the team and the employees part, as part of that business, do they know that, eventually three to five years down the line you have an exit strategy and you have an exit plan do you, is that is that important in terms of i don't know, bring that up all the time <clears throat> so okay. that conversation it depends it depends on um the type of business the person the people who are in there um that that conversation is probably known uh, certainly is known at the investor level so if i've got other partners who have helped me do the of deal course. who have parts of equity then, then we'll have that conversation but we don't try to make it complex so so what I'll, what I'll do in a business, and I do this with clients too, it's the same process. It's a three-pillar process we call scale to sale, right? Yeah. First part is clear end game. So there will be an end game to realize value at a point in time, right? So we'll say, you know, in, in a few years' time, we'll probably look to be selling this business, you know, and we're trying to do it. But I won't go details, this number, and this is how much money we're going to make. That. <laughs> then the middle part is what I call scale fast and build value. Right. So that's where we're looking at the marketing. We're looking at the processes. Uh, we're bringing in different types of capability as required. We're doing joint ventures. We're looking at other acquisitions. Right. But that process there is the, the engine room. That's probably a two year process if we're looking at a around about a three year exit. Got it. And then as we get towards that, as the business is growing and it's looking more valuable, the last 12 months, we get super intentional on the exit. And that's when it will become more common knowledge in the business. And quite often we'll offer options, share options and things like that, because we want to structure the business that if we sell it, the people that are in the business are incentivized to stay on in the business uh, to then run the business for the new owner. Got it. Got it. Now, so that it's, was not, kind of... 
Yeah, that was kind of my big question because it's, you know, kind of the insecurity of this culture of like, oh, my God, I'm going to lose my job type of thing, you know. Yeah, (laughs) but you everything can be done through clarity of communication, incentivization. And, and you know, this is the other thing, like if it's not the right fit for someone. uh, And I had this conversation actually a couple of days ago. um, You know, when you go and buy a business, the most I've ever seen of staff churn is 50 percent. Right. Often it's about 30 percent of people leave because you know they love the old boss or their manager or whatever else but most people have got mortgages you know oh, house you know, yeah school fees like you know and and as long as as long as everything's clear in the communication and people looked after yeah. you find that you know unless it's a misalignment of their values or something which is it's not most people kind of give it a go they give it a chance yeah some good some good points there very cool excellent and then <clears throat> with regards to so you've talked a little bit about how to buy a business now let's talk a little bit about exiting, you know, so because I know we haven't really touched up touch base about that, but when it comes to exiting the business, so so you're the motivated business owner. Well, should we say not so motivated? Should we say tired business owner that wants to sell, right? And you might they might be listening to this podcast right now, but you're just not sure where to go, what to do, what things that you need to have in place any advice there first of all so what well, it depends on the business a little bit um what i don't suggest you do is just go out to a broker and this is what a lot of people do do sometimes they'll just go to their lawyer or their accountants you know one of the, one of the first places you find out about <laughs> deals is from accountants because you know they, they, people tell their accountants before they tell their wives or their partners and whatever else <laughs> <laughs> you know, which makes sense, doesn't it? It's like, well, I'm, I'm thinking yeah, yeah. Well, the, the conversation is actually sometimes I'm thinking of winding the business down. And then it's like, well, you sure you should do that. And then a broker comes in. And the, pro- the problem is there's a lot of businesses out there that are just such small businesses, subscale businesses that you're really yeah. just selling a job. Yeah. And, agree. you know, and if a business is making, you know, 150, 200 grand a year profit, you know, all the way probably up to, you know, even up to half a million, which sounds like a lot, but with taxes and everything else. You know, um, it's hard to then say there's a lot in that other than the owner is the is the bottleneck, right? Yeah, yeah. And if you go out there and say, I'm going to sell my business, you go to a broker. Sometimes the broker will charge a fee up front. Yeah, I'll sell your business. I'll sell your business. But it's really hard. And so what I say to people like that is, firstly, um, give yourself a good runway. If you want to sell your business, mm. give yourself that runway to sell it and build it up to a better level. Build it up, you know, to something that's a bit more interesting or when I come into some of these businesses, I'll just do basic things. Like I'll start to call up the suppliers uh, again, confidentially, or sometimes competitors that can be quite tricky and sensitive and just suggest partnerships and other things. And then you find that the conversation just develops into an acquisition, right? And and they're the exit. But, but that's the sort of thing that people should be doing. They should be looking at where their exit's going to come from. Mm, right. Like so, yeah, you know, and, 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 and that's, and if you can't work that out, then, you know, obviously you bring people like myself into the team in to help you with it. But mm. if, if you, a lot of the time it's like, oh, hold on, my supplier is growing. There's a, you know, they just bought another company. I wonder if they'd want my company. Mm. Okay. And then, and then the sort of the penny drops a bit from there. It's like you're sowing a seed initially because you're kind of, you're, you know, you're, you're already ahead of the game. Do you know what I mean? Better, kind of better to be, better to own the process. So, yeah. you know, back to what I said, if you're clear about your end game, if you've got time to build value, definitely do it. And then when mm. you get on that pathway to exit, the things I look to do is I look to take out any costs in the business that aren't driving value, because again, it's going to increase the profit, therefore the value of the business. Yep. Yep. Um, I look to do partnerships and things like acquisitions in the last 12 months to to start to bring together a bigger, because scale does matter to some extent, right? Having a yep. bigger entity matters. Yes. Um, and then, you know, from that, it's really just about getting a good accountant or finance person to come in there and help you put the proposition together. Because sometimes the way that you package the business and the way you tell the story, and I'm not talking about the, the more complex private equity deals, but just the way you can position the business can increase the value alone. True. So, so there's some there's some pointers there for people who are listening that might be thinking, how do I start this? Very cool. Very cool. Listen, I know we're coming towards the end of our um, conversations. And as much as I love talking, I, we could talk about this. Because it's such an interesting subject, it really is. A, a really interesting. <laughs> There's a lot subject. more depth to it as well. Though. There is a lot go. more depth and stuff like that. <laughs> but for 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 the guys that are 
Um, well, first of all, I, I suppose my a, a summary question would be is what are you working on right now? Because you've been doing this sort of 12, you know, a, a good sort of 15, 20 years now. What are you working on right now? Love to know what you're working on right now. Yeah. So my I spend my time. So it's quite it's quite interesting. So I've got, as I said, we've got six businesses actually at the moment because we've got one that um, we've put together with another one. Um, yep. So that's that's interesting. So I'm always looking to um, buy businesses. So we're always looking at we're looking at the moment in Florida um, for various awesome. reasons. Also because we're looking to take the the coaching consultancy business out there as well. So I'm working on that. Um, our coaching consultancy business, which is called Scale Up Your Business, has been growing a lot. Like it's had a, a really full on couple of um, months, actually. Um, and it's driven, I think, I think because of the scale to sale idea, the concept of that is a bit a bit unusual. Not many people do that. True, so true. I'm, I'm spending quite a lot of time um, talking about that with clients. And I don't do as much client stuff uh, as I used to. Um, but the last couple of months, that's why I was in Dubai flying to Florida, all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and then the last piece for me, you know, we talked about it briefly at the beginning, is um, my podcast, Rebranded. So it used to be called Scale Up Your Business. It's now Scale Up with Nick Bradley. Uh, I've got some guests coming on that are just off the planet, and I can't say who they are. <laughs> <laughs> I know a couple of them, by the way, but I'm not oh. going to say. You guys are going to have to go onto uh, Nick's podcast, onto Apple, all the good platforms, and go download. Honestly, it's a great pla it's a great podcast. I must say so myself, even though you, it conflicts with my <laughs> one, but it doesn't really conflict because because we're both wicked and awesome people anyway. Yeah, so you've got to have you've got to have a repertoire of podcasts because you can't otherwise people are going to get sick <laughs> of my voice. You know, like yeah. You know. But I think the, the other thing I'll say this is. My, my podcast is more about um, growth and mindset than it is about business these days, even though it's business focused. And I talk about the identity of who you need to be to do the stuff that we've talked about for the last hour. So that's where I kind of tend to play these days because, you know, I just honestly believe that, you know, you can only scale a business to the level of your identity. That's very cool. Very true. So, so hope you guys have enjoyed today's conversations with me and Nick. If you have any questions for Nick, please do reach out to him on any of the channels and you can do so uh, by clicking on the links below. Uh, do mention the podcast, by the way, when you do reach out to him. He's very busy. Um, and But essentially, he'll always always have time for people that come from my podcast, of course. <laughs> I'll do my um, best. So, yeah. You know this. I always try and get back to when you contact me as quickly as I can as well. So, you know, I'm doing my best. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Exactly. So, guys, hope you've enjoyed today's episode. Uh, make sure that you listen to, uh, well, we'll be here again as well. We've got some amazing episodes coming up as well. Uh, so make sure that you listen in. Uh, so I hope you've enjoyed today's episode and uh, see you soon, I guess, from me and Nick. Thanks very much. Appreciate your time. Cool. Take care. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. Hey guys, I just want to say thank you so much for listening to today's episode on the Game Changers Experience. I would be gratefully appreciated if you could leave a good or a bad review, it doesn't matter, one or a five star review, whichever you prefer, on any of the platforms, whether it be on Apple, whether it be on Spotify, Podchaser, etc. And please leave a testimonial or review about our podcast. And if you have enjoyed our podcast, then I look forward to seeing you on the next Game Changers Experience. Take care, see you soon.